This episode is sponsored by Kaplan Medical. If you head over to captest.com and use the offer code ITB15, you can get 15% off any Kaplan Medical product. And importantly, for AMA members, you can combine this discount with your AMA membership for a total of 40% off. I want to live outside, live outside of all of this. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. All right, welcome to the Inside the Boards Study Smarter series for the USMLE Step 1 and Comlex Level 1 here today with our friend Greg Rodden, host of the Med School Fizz podcast and voice talent or actor uh, I guess, for our audio cue bank. So, Greg, welcome back. Uh, thanks for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show again. I uh, I love working with you guys, and it's been a pleasure. Well, check out the Med School Fizz podcast, where you can get some more high-yield learning, obviously related to med school physiology. Um, just briefly, Greg, like, what does your show cover, and how do you think it might fit into, say, step one kind of dedicated prep? Yeah. So as I was going through my dedicated board studying time, uh, I noticed that physiology, having a really strong understanding of physiology and pathophysiology, just went much further than memorizing individual facts. And I happen to love uh, learning about physiology and I, and I love to teach. And so I figured, why not combine all these interests into a product that people might like. And I knew that I loved podcasts, so uh, it, it seemed like the perfect avenue for it. The show is mainly targeted towards uh, students in, in their uh, first and second year of medical school, their preclinical years, um, mostly just because it focuses on a lot of the detail involved in medical physiology, whether it's like calcium, homeostasis, or whatever. But I'm sure that, uh, that people further on in their career could, could get something out of it, too. All right. Well, that's great. So yeah, check it out. Do you have a good channel? Is it Med School Fizz? Yeah. So you can find the podcast at uh, Med School Fizz, uh, three separate words, in the iTunes podcast app um, or pretty much any podcast app that uh, that you might use. All right. And we'll have a link in the show notes to that too. So today we're going to focus on some genetics questions because... I don't know. Why did we pick genetics? Who knows? But that's what we're going to do. Uh, so we'll get right into it. These questions are courtesy of Osmosis, your personalized learning platform for med school, often been called the Netflix of medical education. So we thank them for continuing to let us use this content. And here we go. All right. So here we go. Our first question. A three-year-old boy is brought to the clinic by his parents because of complaints of recurrent sinus and respiratory infections. They recently immigrated to the United States two months ago. The mother reveals that the boy was born at home and received no postnatal care. Physical examination shows a boy in mild distress with rhinorrhea and mild crackles on lung auscultation. Cardiac auscultation reveals dextrocardia, which of the following is the most common consequence of the likely condition that this boy has? Is it A, elastic skin, B, infertility, C, interstitial fibrosis, D, tendon xanthomas, or E, tracheoesophageal fistula? Well, uh, this is a very classic question, and the answer for this is B, right? Infertility? Correct. It All is right. B, infertility. So what uh, what does this what does this boy have? What's going on with him? He has primary ciliary dyskinesia or Cartagena's syndrome. Correct. So did you want to take a stab at describing Cartagena's syndrome for our audience, or would uh, would you like me to take the first stab? Yeah, I mean, I would say with uh, diseases like this, um, these are rare diseases in life. On the boards, they're sort of must-know diseases. And the sort of things that you really need to be able to know are the primary problem 
um, or pathophysiologic issue with the disease. So in this case, it's a defective uh, dynein protein, uh, which is an essential component of cilia. And with cartagoners, the cilia don't move right. And pulmonary problems and, of course, infertility, the answer here. And you can see that uh, infertility both in females because the uh, the fallopian tube has cilia that beat the ovum or, or uh, zygote towards the uterus before implantation, or, of course, in males because dynein is also a component of the flagellum of the sperm. So in summary, I would say, what do you have to know about cartagoners? Defect in dynein protein that causes infertility due to dysfunction of uh, sperm or cilia, problems with the lungs uh, due to an impaired mucociliary elevator, um, so they get recurrent uh, sinus infections or um, actually can get bronchiectasis from you know uh, infections, and um, what else? Oh, situs inversus, uh, that other kind of classic finding. Um, anything to add on that? Yeah, so with the... I'm a minimalist. I don't want to remember anything more than I have to <laughs> about each of these diseases, which is why I think I'd probably still at least pass step one if I had to take it like nowadays. I don't know if I would do as well as somebody who is now dedicating, you know, like eight weeks or something to studying it. I'd like to think so, but not an experiment I want to undertake. But sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Um, yeah, un unfortunately, while you're studying for step one, you, you really do have to get down into the weeds of these things because pretty much anyone who sees a kid in a vignette and they have recurrent uh, sinus infections, recurrent pulmonary infections, um, so you're, you're immediately thinking of either like cystic fibrosis or primary ciliary dyskinesia. And then thankfully, this question adds in the cardiac auscultation, which reveals dextrocardia. Uh, and that really helps you to narrow down the diagnosis to primary ciliary dyskinesia, specifically Cartagener syndrome, rather than cystic fibrosis. To um, quickly cover the other answer choices, so elastic skin, with that, you're thinking about like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, which is due to a collagen defect. Uh, interstitial fibrosis, not really a component of Cartagener syndrome. It's more the bronchiectasis that you see. Uh, tendons anthomas, um, there you're thinking about some kind of usually familial hyperlipidemia. Uh, the most common one is familial hypercholesterolemia due to LDL receptor defects. And um, tracheoesophageal fistula, that's more of a not really with Cartagener syndrome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think one thing that we can kind of observe here is this is a good example of how a question can be made easy or difficult based on the answer choices. So keeping in mind that the National Board of Medical Examiners and uh, Osteopathic Medical Examiners Board, they require that each of the answer choices be on a continuum. So each of these answer choices that you um, will see during a testing environment is going to be more or less correct, right? And it's sort of beat into that these are single best answer questions. So this question could probably be made significantly or at least somewhat harder by switching up the answer choices. And, you know, one critical answer choice that would probably have you thinking, ah, I don't know which, you know, which one it is, um, would be uh, cystic fibrosis. And uh, it's kind of merciful that they didn't put it here. But in your mind, taking this vignette without any changes, um, what would be the thing that would clue you into Cartagoners over cystic fibrosis? Yeah, so, and I kind of tried to allude to that earlier, but it's that the kicker of the dextrocardia on exactly. cardiac auscultation. Because with cystic fibrosis, you don't, you're not going to develop situs inversus. Um, it's more of a problem of chloride channels and, and they'll develop very salty sweat and um, they'll also develop uh, recurrent respiratory infections because their mucus is so thick that their cilia can't beat the mucus effectively. But it's not that they have a problem with their cilia. It's that they have a problem with the chloride channel. 
And I will say, as far as infertility goes, it's a stronger association for males with congenital absence of the vas deferens in cystic fibrosis than females. Uh, let's move on. Okay. Go to a two-year-old boy who comes into the office because of developmental delay. His mother reports that he has yet to speak any words. He has a paternal uncle with intellectual disabilities. His physical examination shows a prominent jaw and large ears. Head circumference measurement shows the patient is at the 60th percentile. And the question is, which of the following genetic defects is most likely to be found in this patient? Is it A, maternal non-disjunction, B, a novel point mutation, C, paternal non-disjunction, or D, a trinucleotide repeat expansion? And the correct answer is uh, D, a trinucleotide repeat expansion. Just working through this question, we have this boy who comes in with developmental delay. He's two years old and he hasn't spoken any words yet, so that's abnormal. They should be speaking by one year of age. Uh, additionally, we learn that he has a family history. He has a paternal uncle with intellectual disability. So since we're seeing a pattern in men, we might be thinking, okay, maybe this is some kind of X-linked uh, disorder. Then we're told that he has a big jaw uh, and he has big ears. Uh, so that should immediately be ringing bells in our head um, for something called fragile X syndrome, uh, which we'll discuss in a minute. Uh, we're told that he has head circumference that that's at the 60th percentile that doesn't really change how we're thinking about this and then the question is uh what what's the cytogenetic defect that we're going to see um so of course they don't specifically ask you know what's what's the diagnosis uh because they don't they don't like word association very much but if you can kind of take it the next step further and and understand that fragile x syndrome is due to a trinucleotide repeat you've got the answer uh in your clutches so I guess let's talk about fragile X syndrome a little bit. So fragile X syndrome is uh, the most common uh, cause of mental retardation in males, or at least inherited mental retardation in males. Um, it's due to uh, trinucleotide repeats um, of the FMR1 gene or fragile X uh, mental retardation gene. And unfortunately, even, even on the USMLE, they sometimes want you to know what the trinucleotide repeat is. So this one um, is CGG. Here's what I would say. I don't know if this mnemonic works for people, but because you're listening to this and context really can form your memories, maybe it'll help. So fragile X syndrome, the nucleotide repeat is CGG, right? Um, and it's a sex-linked disorder, so it's in males. So one of the ways you might remember this is comparing it to the other common trinucleotide repeat um, expansion diseases that are seen on the USMLE. This one has two Gs, right? So it's really going to affect guys. So CGG, it's like CG squared. I don't know, that might help. With Friedrich ataxia, another one, that one's autosomal recessive, and that's a uh, GAA repeat in the frataxin. So to me, I'd get those all jumbled. Fragile X, in my mind, I do know that that's X-linked. I do know that sort of um, phenotype with the you know larger ears, the prominent jaw, um, and that it occurs in males, and that it's guy, guy, CGG. Um, yeah. And also, it, you can remember it as uh, they become like super guys in puberty as they develop macro orchidism. Ah, uh, so they develop okay. <laughs> they develop uh, huge, huge testes. Another uh, mnemonic that that some people use, like in med school, when we were trying to cram these in. So for Friedrich's ataxia, uh, that's due to a GAA repeat on the frataxin gene on chromosome nine. And we remembered it as uh, gah, I missed my taxi. Um, and oh, so like yeah. someone, <laughs> someone exclaims, gah, I missed my taxi. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and that's how we remembered the GAA repeat for Huntington's disease. Uh, remembering that it's a CAG repeat on chromosome four, um, in the HTT gene. Some people remember it as hunt, uh, has four letters. And so chromosome four, and then I just remembered it because I've seen it so many times CAG repeats, um, 
And then for myotonic dystrophy, like you said, uh, it's it's like a DMPK1 mutation or a trinucleotide repeat of CTG, um, and it's on chromosome 19. And that one I've also just seen like 50 times, and that's that's why I remember it. But maybe hearing it multiple times throughout this episode <laughs> will help. Or maybe we'll just edit it out. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's see, because uh, I found a, a another one, and and to be frank, I just googled this, so like this isn't off the top of my mind. Um, just full disclosure. Here's one, um, and then myotonic dystrophy. You see tonic gestures, CTG, and then Huntington's uh, could be you hunt animals and put them in a cage, right? Huntington's cage, C A G. I don't know. One of those might work for you, but if you can't or do have trouble uh, memorizing them, then uh, come up with your own mnemonic and uh, or use one of these. You can rewind if you'd like uh, and pick the one that works. All right. Well, thank you for bearing with us through that question. Uh, our next question, we go to an eight-year-old boy is brought to his pediatrician's office for a well child check. The mother reports that he has a history of seizures and ataxia. Throughout the interview, the patient inappropriately laughs and frequently smiles. The mother mentions that he has had academic troubles in school. Genetic testing later shows a mutation in the maternal copy of chromosome 15. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, Angelman syndrome, B, Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, C, prader willi syndrome, or D, Rett syndrome? And the answer here is Angelman syndrome. Angelman syndrome is uh, a genetic disorder due to a phenomenon called genomic imprinting, right? So this is a phenomenon in which the expression of certain alleles on a chromosome are determined by whether or not they are paternal or maternal in origin. So normally the paternal alleles on chromosome 15 are silenced through methylation while the maternal alleles on chromosome 15 are active. But in the case of Angelman syndrome, the maternal alleles are mutated, and so instead of being active and normal, you get a disease resulting, in, and that is Angelman syndrome, which is characterized, like we saw in the vignette, by mental retardation, myotonic or jerking movements of the extremities, the frequent smiling and inappropriate laughter, which gives it the happy puppet syndrome. And I guess um, we should say with uh, Angelman syndrome, uh, it's often discussed in the context of its corollary disease, which is Prader-Willi syndrome. And do you want to take a stab at summarizing that? Sure. Um, so Prader-Willi syndrome is due to a deletion, a, a micro deletion of the paternal allele of 15Q. So if the paternal allele is deleted and normally the maternal allele is silenced, now that boy, it's usually a boy, is missing out on expression of that section of 15Q. And they develop um, symptoms of hypotonia, uh, hypogonadism, uh, mental retardation, uh, hyperphagia, and uh, obesity. And so that's kind of the cluster of symptoms that results in Prader-Willi syndrome. And um, it's due to, uh, again, paternal allele deletion of uh, 15Q, and normally the maternal allele is silenced by methylation, and so they miss out on 15Q. Now let's talk about some of the other answer choices. Uh, so the correct answer choice this time was Angelman syndrome, and some of the other answer choices were uh, Beckwith-Weidman syndrome. So Beckwith-Weidman syndrome, it's kind of a crazy syndrome where they have like Hemi hypertrophy, and they can get Wilms tumor with it. I'm trying to remember some of the other uh, macroglossia. I think is another thing that you can see with Beckwith Weidman. Uh, big organs, viscera megaly, omphalocele. If they're if they're going to describe that to you in a question stem, they're going to give you all the components of Beckwith Weidman. They're usually going to be asking, "What's the diagnosis?" You'll be able to pick it up. And then we already talked about Prader-Willi syndrome, and so the last answer choice was uh, Rett syndrome. So Rett syndrome is a really devastating condition where kids going along just fine, developing fine, and then all of a sudden they just start regressing. Um, 
So their uh, physical growth starts to um, starts to slow down, like the their head size will start to decrease. But also the skills that they've previously mastered, like language and I think sometimes physical skills too, will start to decline. Um, and and it's usually um, in a kid. I think it's like eighteen months, something like that. Don't quote me on that exact number, but um, it's it's usually a young kid that you'll see this in. And, yes, the uh, symptoms are usually like in the toddler period between, or they come on by you know age one to three. And one thing that uh, that this explanation also mentions is that um, it, it almost exclusively affects females, um, but it has been found in, in some male patients. But um, usually you're thinking about female patients with uh, Rett syndrome. I think it's also due to like a mutation in MECP2. I don't know why that's coming to mind, but pretty sure that that's correct. Yeah, you're you're right, actually. So next, uh, we're moving on to our next question here. A five-month-old infant is brought by her distressed mother to the pediatrician's office because of easy bruising. She reports that her child bruises easily on his back and arms when he is laid in the crib every night. She also states that his joints feel loose and she is afraid of dislocating his shoulders when she picks him up. Physical examination shows ecchymoses, hyperextensible skin, and cigarette paper-like stretch marks on the skin. Which of the following best describes the defect causing this infant's presentation? Is it A, sphingomyelinase deficiency, B, dynean arm defect, C, faulty collagen synthesis, or D, fibrillin gene mutation? All right, so this one's going to be uh, impaired or faulty collagen synthesis. So tell me about this disease, which is Ehlers-Danlos. Right. Yes. So Ehlers-Danlos is most commonly due to a collagen type 5 uh, defect. And if you have trouble making collagen, um, you're going to have trouble with a lot of different aspects of your body's physiology, everything from your joints to your skin um, to your blood vessels. So they're usually going to present with hypermobile joints um, hyperextensible skin. Uh, so like as you pick up the skin, you can just keep on picking it up. Um, and also easy bruising um, because collagen is part of the vasculature. So um, there's a bunch of different kinds of Ehlers-Danlos. Let's see, it's usually, it's usually going to be autosomal dominant, but it can be autosomal recessive. The vascular subtype is due to a collagen type 3 defect, and that's the one where they have lots of bruising, um, but you can see bruising in, in the various different forms of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And probably the last things that we should cover about Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, um, sometimes they can also present with uh, scoliosis, with that general joint laxity and, and that kind of presentation. Um, but also some of the scary side effects, uh, in addition to the bruising, they can also get um, heart defects like mitral valve prolapse um, and even spontaneous pneumothorax. And if you think about spontaneous pneumothorax, if their collagen is defective, um, maybe they're more likely to develop blebs that can then pop um, and develop spontaneous pneumothorax. That's pretty much uh, pretty much it for Ehlers-Danlos. Um, did you want to go over some of the other uh, answer choices? Yeah. Um, so answer choice A was uh, sphingomyelinase deficiency, and uh, that describes the disease called Neiman-Pick disease, which is one of these inborn errors of metabolism, kind of a, lysoso a rare lysosomal storage disease, um, which involves a defect in sphingomyelinase. The result is a buildup of sphingomyelin, and that buildup of this uh, uh, substance uh, leads to a few classic findings you should remember. A cherry red spot on the macula, and also note that Tay Sachs can also present with a cherry red spot on the macula. Uh, hepatosplenomegaly, progressive neurodegeneration, and foam cells. I like this mnemonic for Neiman Pick, which I think comes from first aid, but that's like no man picks his nose with his sphinger. So Neiman Pick, <laughs> <laughs> Neiman Pick, oh, sphingomyelinase. Um, and then just highlighting some of the other important components about Neiman Pick disease. So it is an autosomal recessive disease. Like you said, they develop lots of sphingomyelin in their lysosomes. Um, and you can see those foam, those foamy macrophages, right, which are trying to clean up some of that excess sphingomyelin. 
what else? Oh, and then a good way that you can distinguish Neiman Pick disease from Tay-Sachs disease, right? So they both can have that cherry red macula. However, Tay-Sachs disease does not have hepatosplenomegaly, while Neiman Pick disease does. All right, cool. For, and for those of you who stuck around to the end, thank you. I want to tell you about a kind of a fun thing we're doing. So this is going to be a fake USMLE question campaign, and we're tying it to a contest. So from now until July 15th, head over to Twitter, go to my page, at Boards Insider, look for the pinned tweet. What we're doing are fake USMLE questions. So here's an example. If Deadpool were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be A, dissociative identity disorder, B, bipolar disease, C, antisocial personality disorder, or D, other. So here are the contest rules. You want to tag the character on Twitter. For instance, Deadpool is at Deadpool movie in the question vignette and just set it up like if the character were in a USMLE question vignette, his most likely diagnosis would be and then make a Twitter poll, pick four answer choices, and tag inside the boards, as well as Gomer Blog. That's at Boards Insider and at Gomer Blog. And then finally, use the hashtag FakeUSMLE. The most creative fake USMLE question will get a one year subscription to our All Audio Q Bank for free. We'll have fun while doing it. Maybe learn something. I don't know. It was just something that I thought would be a lot of fun. And you can also do it on other social media. I guess Reddit, Facebook, and Instagram, where on each platform we are at Inside the Boards. Or you can just send us an email to info at InsideTheBoards.com if you would like to contribute to the fake USMLE campaign. Just wanted to thank Rao Reynolds and Enter Shikari for letting us use the track Live Outside off The Spark, their new album, about which Rao said, What I was trying to do with this album in marrying the personal and the political is to ensure that human vulnerability is laid bare and to not be afraid to speak about emotions. Plus, this album is a little lighter than what you heard previously with the song Anesthetist. At any rate, check out enter shikari.com